You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. The idea to call upon the Estates General was pitched by the Assembly of Notables, a group set up by the King on February 22, 1787, which hadn't been convened since way back in 1614. The Parliament of Paris, packed with nobles protecting their interests, was putting up a roadblock against Charles Alexandre de Calonne's plans for critical financial reforms. Calonne, entrusted by the King as the Controller General of Finances to tackle the fiscal deficit, sought to sidestep this opposition by bringing back the old school institution. The initial group of notables was quite the assembly, featuring 137 nobles, including stars of the future French Revolution like the Comte de Mirabeau and the Marquis de Lafayette already famous for his pivotal role in the American Revolution. However, this assembly didn't play nice with Cologne, effectively showing him the door on April 8, 1787, and even exiling him shortly after for suggesting a land tax named Subvention Territoriale. Despite his exile, Cologne kept a keen eye on French politics from London. Etienne Charles de Lomény de Brienne, who was leading the notables at the time, stepped into Cologne's shoes as the Controller General of Finances next. He even got a bump up to prime minister by the king, a role that also included managing finances. Yet the notables remained stubborn, shooting down numerous proposals without loosening the purse strings for the king. Lafayette hinted that maybe what was needed was a national assembly. When Brienne pressed if he meant the estates general, Lafayette confirmed, leading Brienne to note it down officially. Faced with ongoing financial deadlock, the king, in a blend of frustration and theatrics, spent a whole day lecturing them before dissolving the assembly on May 25th. Their proposals were sent back to the parliament, bringing things full circle. In a turn back towards the parliaments, the king encountered their persistence in challenging issues similar to those brought up by the assembly of notables. Their main job, beyond advising the king, was to officially acknowledge his edict by recording them, essentially saying a simple yes to his decisions. This had been straightforward for previous kings, who managed it through a mix of firmness and outright anger. If the parliaments didn't record these edicts, they couldn't become law. On the 6th of July, 1787, Lomeni sent over for registration two new taxes, the land subsidy and the stamp edict, somewhat inspired by America's Stamp Act. The Parliament, however, wouldn't register what they saw as illegal, asking for financial reports up front. The King refused this demand, leading the Parliament to insist on either the reports or a convening of the Estates General. Not willing to back down, the King ordered the Parliament to Versailles on August 6, where he personally demanded they record the taxes. The next day, once back in Paris, the Parliament firmly declared his order null and void, stating that only the Estates General had the authority to approve taxes. Faced with strong public support for the Parliament, the King had them meet away from Paris in Troy, Champagne, on August 15th, without appearing himself. Through a messenger, they struck a deal. In exchange for dropping the stamp tax and modifying the land tax to exclude nobles' lands, the Parliament would agree to the registration of additional loans. Feeling encouraged, Lomeni, with the King's backing, exceeded the initial agreement with the Parliament by proposing a continuous loan scheme until 1792, essentially giving the King unchecked financial power. The Parliament hesitated, leading the King to cunningly schedule a royal hunt on November 19th, where he and his court donned in hunting attire, barged into the Parliament session demanding immediate registration of his financial scheme. After hours of debate, it was clear the issue was too big to be resolved without the Estates General, contradicting the King's view of absolute monarchy. As tensions peaked, the King demanded the registration of the continuous loan, leading to a sharp exchange with the Duc d'Orléans, who questioned the legality of the session, resulting in the King storming out and the subsequent issuance of arrest warrants for dissidents on November 20th, who were then detained comfortably away from Paris. With the King and Parliament at an impasse, Brienne suggested an alternate plan during the winter reviving ancient legal jurisdictions to replace the Parliament's functions, effectively sidelining them. However, when the government tried to quietly pass this plan, Jean-Jacques Duval de Permesnil got wind of it, leading to an open defiance by the Parliament and the issuance of arrest warrants for him and another, who both took refuge in the Parliament. When the King sent guards to arrest them, they surrendered, but the Parliament's dramatic silent procession, flanked by guards, and the handing over of the key to their building to the King, marked a significant moment of confrontation. The process of handing over control to a new government was scheduled to start on May 8, 1788. This was supposed to happen through the formal approval of the new government's foundational documents by regional courts known as parliaments. 
However, these regional courts stood united against this move, following the lead of the Parliament of Paris. When representatives of the king tried to force the issue, the parliament members left their meeting in protest, only to come back the next day to officially overturn the approval. This defiance led to armed protests across the country, with notable street clashes happening in Rennes, Brittany. There, a group sent to Paris to argue their case was arrested and held in the Bastille prison. The Bretons in Paris went on to establish the Breton Club, which was later renamed as the Jacobin Society. Attempts to set up major regional courts, known as the Grand Bailliages, failed, and the plenary court, another governmental body, only managed to meet once. Back on January 24, 1789, King Louis XVI of France decided it was time to call together the Estates General, a form of assembly that hadn't been gathered for a whopping 175 years. He sent out a formal invitation known as a Lettre de Roi, accompanied by a set of rules or a reglement. In his letter, King Louis got straight to the point. He needed the help of his loyal subjects to figure out a solution to the country's financial troubles. He expressed his intentions to hear out the grievances of the people, promising reforms, a stable and lasting order, and prosperity for all. In simpler terms, he was ready to listen and make changes for the better. He stressed the importance of electing deputies from the most respected members of each community to discuss and document any complaints and grievances. Following the king's announcement, official instructions were dispatched to every province, outlining how these elections should be carried out. During the autumn prior to this royal call to action, the Parliament of Paris, a group of aristocrats that advised the king, had laid out that this gathering should follow the format of the 1614 Assembly. Given that nearly two centuries had passed since then, it was clear that the Estates General wasn't exactly a regular feature in French political life. By sticking as closely as possible to the old ways, both the king and the parliament hoped they could keep a tight rein on the people's power. Historically, the voting within the estates was structured so that the nobility and clergy could band together to outvote the commons by a two-to-one margin. However, there was a lot of chatter, especially in the newspapers of the time, in autumn 1788, about changing this system to one person, one vote truly reflect the majority. The public, optimistic as ever, believed that with enough support from the nobility and clergy, they could influence important decisions. A so-called national party emerged, arguing that France was in dire need of a constitution, something it never really had. On the flip side, those who supported the king saw the absolute monarchy as the constitution. Amidst this debate, there was a push for the commons to have double the representation compared to the other two estates. This move, known as doubling the third, was seen by the king as a way to boost his lagging popularity confident that he could maintain influence over the nobility and clergy with this concession. Let's talk about a fascinating aspect of French history, the Estates General. Picture this, the first estate, which includes about 100,000 Catholic clergy members. They had quite the influence, owning roughly 10% of the land and even collecting taxes from peasants. The leadership here was mainly in the hands of bishops and heads of monasteries. However, when it came to choosing delegates, the scene was a bit different. Out of 303 delegates, the majority were regular parish priests, with just 51 bishops among them. Moving on to the second estate, this group represented the nobility, totaling around 400,000 people. They owned a significant chunk of land, about 25%, and had the privilege of collecting various dues and rents from peasant tenants. Of their 282 delegates, about a third owned land though mostly minor holdings. Then we had the third estate, which essentially represented everyone else, about 98% of France's population at the time, or roughly 28 million people. Their representation doubled to 578 men for this particular gathering. This group was diverse, with half being well-educated folks, such as lawyers and local officials. Nearly a third were involved in trades or industry, and 51 were wealthy landowners. Election rules were fascinating, they specified that each of the three estates would vote separately. Each tax district would choose its delegates for the third estate, while the first and second estate would have their delegates elected in separate ballots by judicial districts. What's more, each voting assembly collected a notebook of grievances to be looked over by the convocation. The way delegates were distributed mainly depended on the population size, with cities like Paris taking a leading role. Voters had to be male at least 25 years old, property owners, and registered taxpayers. About 1,200 delegates were elected, with half representing the third estate. The first and second estates had about 300 each. 
A key difference from the past was that nobility didn't have to run for election to the second estate, leading many to be elected to the third estate instead. Some of these noble third estate delegates, like John Joseph Mounier and the Comte de Mirabeau, were quite passionate about revolutionary changes. Despite being elected to represent the third estate, history took a grim turn for many of these nobles during the terror, with several meeting their end by guillotine. It's interesting to note that the second estate's nobles were among the wealthiest and most powerful. The king expected support from them and the first estate's bishop, but many of the elected first estate delegates were parish priests who sided with the common people. The elections for the third estate mainly brought in magistrates and lawyers. It's noteworthy that the lower levels of society, despite their significant numbers, didn't have a voice in the estates general. The list of grievances highlighted a universal frustration with taxes seen as a heavy burden. This financial strain, the resentment towards aristocratic privilege and tax exemptions, and the complaint about tolls and duties hindering trade were significant points of contention between the people and the monarchy from the get-go. On May 5, 1789, with a backdrop of festivities, the Estates General gathered in a specially constructed setup at the Hotel de Menus Plaisir in Versailles, close to the royal palace. This event was marked by the revival of old protocols from 1614, showcasing the clergy and nobility in their grand costumes seated in a distinguished manner, while representatives of the third estate were positioned at a distance as per tradition. On the following day, during addresses by King Louis XVI and Charles Louis Francois de Paul de Barenton, keeper of the seals of France, it became apparent to the third estate that, although they had been granted double representation, the voting would still follow the old by orders method, meaning each estate's vote counted equally, regardless of its size. The King and Barenton's main focus seemed to be on tax discussions, effectively sidelining the increased representation of the third estate to a mere symbolic gesture without real power. Jacques Necker, the Director General of Finance, who showed some understanding of the Third Estate's position, chose only to discuss financial matters, leaving it to Barrington to explain the operational procedures of the Estate General. The decision by the King and his officials to dodge the issue of representation and prioritize tax discussions greatly underestimated the desires of the Third Estate. They were pushing for a unified meeting with equal voting rights for each delegate, standing against the other estate's interest, who feared losing power to the third estate more than they hoped to gain from challenging the king. Necker, though empathetic to the third estate's cause, hesitated to take decisive action until a deadlock was reached. By the time the king finally agreed to the demands of the third estate, it appeared as a forced concession rather than a generous offer, which did little to enhance the monarchy's standing among the people. The Estates General hit a deadlock when the Second Estate wanted to hold meetings in three separate locations, sticking to the old ways. The Comte de Mirabeau, a noble yet chosen to speak for the Third Estate, tried but couldn't manage to keep everyone together in one room for the discussion. Instead of talking about the King's taxes, the three estates ended up separately debating how the legislature should be organized. This situation dragged on without any progress until May 27, when the nobles decided they would verify their members on their own. The next day, the Abbe Cies, a high-ranking clergyman also representing the Third Estate, suggested that the Third Estate, now calling themselves the Communes or Commons, go ahead with verification and invite the others but not wait for them. By June 13, 1789, the Third Estate was ready to figure out how the three estates could work together. They asked the clergy and nobles to join this effort. But by June 17th, with no solution in sight, the Third Estate took a bold step. They transformed themselves into the National Assembly, an assembly representing the people, not the estates. They asked the other estates to join, but made it clear they were moving forward with or without them. Given their numbers were larger than the other estates combined, they could lead any shared assembly, especially since decisions would be made based on majority votes. A departure from the old system where each estate had equal say despite the third estate making up the majority of the population. Initially, the third estate had wanted twice the representation to match the power of the other two estates, who flat out refused this request. The king tried to stop these changes. On the advice of his advisors, he planned to annul the National Assembly's decisions and demanded the estates to separate and follow his reforms. On June 20th, he got the National Assembly's meeting hall shut. Undeterred, the assembly found a new spot at a nearby tennis court, making the famous tennis court oath, promising not to disband until France had a new constitution. 
When they were kicked out from there too, they moved to the Church of St. Louis, where the majority of the clergy decided to join them, showing that attempts to keep the old ways were only speeding up changes. On June 23rd, in a royal meeting, the king announced a new constitution that still wanted separate discussions for the three estates, essentially three chambers. This plan failed too. Even the nobility who had held out joined the National Assembly at the king's own request. Thus, the traditional estates general was no more, giving way to the National Assembly, which on July 9th, 1789, got a new name, the National Constituent Assembly. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.